In the next step that we have now seen how we can actually model convolutions with a mask, we can go to building our own pixel CNN. So pixel CNN does nothing else than stacking a lot of mass convolutions here uh, with a vertex stack and the horizontal stack. The only difference uh, compared to our code before is that we use a gated block instead of just simply summing. So what it specifically does is that we have on the left here our vertical stack and on the right here we have our horizontal stack. You see that with these two convolutions. However, we have a bit more complex dynamic between the two filters instead of just summing. So specifically we have here a connection which goes from the vertical to our horizontal stack with a one by one convolution. So we just transform our uh, pixels, uh, our features a little more before summing here. What you also see is that we have first of all a residual connection for the horizontal stack because this is also uh, the horizontal features are the ones we will predict our output on. Therefore it's good to have here a ResNet connection. And we have here different activation functions we might not have already seen. This is also called when a gate, that's why it's a gated convolution. The idea here is to use the same approach as in the LSDM. So you have a sigmoid as a gate of 0 and 1 and a ton h for the value. This is similar to the input and modulation gate in uh, LSDM. And the idea here is just that it allows you a bit more complex um, features to get out. So some people then use that also as a hyperparameter. However, it costs more in number of features because you have to output two times your output features before doing that. So this is again just a design choice which you might see once in a while. We can just implement it here very simple. So this is up here the computation graph basically and down here is the PyTorch implementation which is I think not too important right now. Now we can build our model. So our model will consist of stacking these gated convolution blocks multiple times. However, um, we also want to have a larger receptor field. So as you know, um, if I would just apply a convolution after convolution after convolution, my receptor field goes very slowly, especially if I use DVT convolutions. And instead of just continuing stacking millions of convolutions, we can also use different ideas. The idea here is to use dilated convolutions. So you can, of course, also in your pixel scene and first downscale the image and then upscale again, which is done, for example, in pixel scene and plus plus. So uh, the successor of this one. However, the easy idea here is to use dilated convolutions as well to show you one more trick um, on the convolutions. So dilated convolutions, if you have here the input, instead of just applying a figure T, you always skip a pixel in between. This is when with a dilation factor of two, with four you skip three pixels and so on. So you basically always skip pixels in between and there you see that we actually have a, a look at the image as a five by five input grid. However, we only have nine weights. So this is basically a sparse five by five uh, kernel when we had. This allows us to still uh, look at larger parts of the image without having a high parameter cost. So the pixel CNN is then implemented below here. As I said, we first have a vertical and a horizontal stack which mask the center because during training we will input the true image and then on the first convolution we should not look at our actual pixel we want to predict afterwards while the other ones then don't have to mask the center. We have then the gated blocks with uh, dilations with 2, 4 and 2 to have an increase of size. Um, and for example when the whole forward uh, path is just running all the convolutions, having an output one by one convolution for the prediction and our output sizes when batch, number of classes, channels, height, width. So basically the same image just with now a class dimension. And we can use again bits per dimension score etc on our um, image. So this is everything you already have seen. And for the sampling, sampling is straightforward in uh, auto recursive models, but you see here loop. Um, so this is not good, however it's straightforward to implement because we just put in always an image um, and then predict one pixel at a time. And then always if you have predicted a pixel you add 
it to your input image and run the input image again and predict the next pixel and so on. So it takes a time, this is why you have here multiple uh, for loops, which also slow down the sampling a lot. So before we start training, it's always good to again visualize our receptor field to check if we have actually a good uh, coverage of the image. And here it's actually two. So if we have a mask with a center pixel, we look almost at everything on top. However, you also see that we don't see everything, which means that if you actually want to predict the pixel on the lower right, we will not see the whole image, but only one fourth. So therefore it's actually important in autoregressive models, if you make them deeper, um, to have an also receptor field over the whole image. But here for our sim uh, simple part, we don't do that. Now that we have built our model, we can finally train it. So we have here again our training loop, which is nothing uh, surprising. Uh, I think this is already something you have seen a couple of times with PyTorch Lightning. And we can then train our model below here. Also, this is just loading the pre-trained model and checking our test result, which is here 0 0.8 bits per dimension. If you remember from normalizing flows, these models usually had a bit per dimension score on the same data set of 1.0, um, which already shows you that there is quite a gap. However, at the same time, you also see that it, um, so that autoregressive models are better in the sense of bit per dimension score. Well, this is also because it's easier to model here. So we always have a conditional to predict one pixel. We know already everything else. Um, which makes it easy to train to easily have a low likelihood. However, normalizing flows in comparison can generate the whole image at once. Right, so this is why, yes, they, um, like pixel scene ends are often stronger than normalizing flows and have a slightly lower parameter cost, which obviously depends on your design choices. However, their big disadvantage is sampling time, which we can look at below here. So let's just sample a batch of uh, 16 images. So actually, let's do a few less so that we take four images. There you see it already takes a few seconds. So this took us now almost four seconds uh, to generate these four images, while in a normalizing flow, we took just a few milliseconds because we just have to do one forward pass, while in a pixel scene, and we have to take 28 times 28 forward passes. The images right now here are not looking too good. However, in general, autoregressive models can predict better digits uh, because they also have a lower likelihood. However, it takes just much longer. The same we can look at down here. Um, so if I now want to generate a 64 times 64 image, you see that this now takes actually almost 20 seconds just to generate one part. Now imagine this would be in a pipeline where you would have to generate all the time images, that takes a long time. So this is why autoregressive models are not used if you really need a fast sampling uh, time. And therefore, if we also look here to just check, okay, can we generalize to uh, our sizes? Well, then you see, okay, we have a few digits on the upper left. So we have actually 28 times 28 images we have trained on. We try to generate 64 times 64, and there you see from the initial digit up here, it does mostly random things. So clearly also autoregressive model is specific to the size it has been trained. Another very common uh, application of autoregressive models is autocompletion. So in the assignment two, you had, for example, you start with a small input sentence and try to autocomplete it, right? So that you try to finish the sentence with your model well, we can do that here as well with images. So what we take, we take here an input image, we split it in half, or we take only the first few pixels. Uh, I think here actually the first 10 pixels, yeah, exactly. So the first 10 rows and let the model then autocomplete the image uh, 12 times. And you see the first one, for example, has one different sevens with different styles. Next one has different sixes. Some of them look a bit weirder than others. Well, if you actually want to predict a nine, you see that it is quite diverse. So the nine could actually be auto-completed with a zero, with an eight, with a three. Um, so therefore, you see that it still has some diversity in it. And this auto-completion sampling 
and shows you uh, what you could actually complete the image with. So especially in RGB images, this can be sometimes helpful or even just fun to generate uh, the complete image as it is. The last part I want to do here with experiments is to look again a bit at the distribution we have. So what do I mean with a distribution? So let's first of all look at the pixel value distribution in our data set. So specifically, which pixel values come in our uh, data set, how often occurring them. So in, in this sense, how often do I have a zero in my data set in any image, in any pixel, how often do I have a one, and so on. And these are basically the pixel values with a histogram, how often they occur, and you see that definitely the black pixels here are in the majority, while we have also some peaks around 64, 128, and 192 or 191, you see that probably comes from the deep, from the quantization actually from the MNIST data set, um, which might just happen here to be focused on these D values. And we have a stronger part also on the white pixels here. So now let's first check if our model over a lot of generated images actually does the same. And we see that these two distributions are quite similar. So indeed it captures the pixel value distribution of the data set. However, what I wanted to look at more specifically is if I want to now generate the next pixel, so one pixel, how do these softmax probability distributions over 256 values actually look like? And this is what I do here. I take four random images, four pixels in them, and visualize here the, uh, the distribution of the softmax, so which value the next pixel should have. And there you see that especially these two up here are quite noisy, so that is almost random, um, while these two are even more smooth, as you can also see with two very strong pixels, uh, pixel values of x close to 1 and 0. However, what I want to really visualize here is the noise in our predictions. So if you look here, you see that values, suddenly this value here is much more likely than if I reduce it by 1. So if I look as a human at the image, I cannot tell you if a white pixel has a value 64, 63. Right, so these are basically indistinguishable. And if you take real images, you often have Gaussian noise on them. So that you would also imagine that your model here should still learn in a softmax that the value 63 and 64 are highly related. So that if I have a high likelihood for a value 64, then I should also have a relatively high likelihood for 63 because I might have some noise in it. In this case here, you see if I just use a softmax for which it doesn't actually know that 64 and 63 are integers that are related, uh, it doesn't really learn it. So this is a problem if you want to generalize. Um, and therefore there are some ideas to make it better. One of them is how, how about you predict always Gaussians. So you actually predict a mixture of Gaussian distribution instead of a softmax just in a discrete space. So you can take it, um, basically a Gaussian and discretize it, which comes similar out as a discrete logistic distribution, which you see here. And this is something what Pixel CNN++ and the modern auto recursive models do. So they predict then always uh, a mixture of Gaussians, in, uh, discrete Gaussians, instead of a softmax, which allows you to already learn the relations between closed byte pixels. So this is then already the end of the notebook. What I just wanted to say here as a conclusion is that we have looked at our uh, model um, for auto-recursive image modeling so that we generate an uh, image pixel by pixel. We have seen that this is very good in likelihood modeling, and this is also still the case. Auto-recursive models are one of the models of state-of-the-art for bits per dimension on several small data sets like Cypher, not on high-resolution ones. And they can be still very powerful. Um, current advances in those is, for example, when what we have seen with discrete logistic distribution instead of a softmax, but also uh, that you change the pixel order. So we have said, okay, we start on the left upper and go row by row. But other um, papers, for example, try to learn the order of what is also popular called pixel snail is that you go on the diagonals. 
so that you start with the left upper pixel and then go in diagonals uh, through the image, which can often give you a slightly better performance. Nevertheless, this notebook should uh, wrap up now our discussion of generative modeling, as we have seen via ease, GANs, normalizing flows, and now as the last part, are two aggressive models.